So hello everybody and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for going ahead with the organization of this uh, nice uh, meeting in spite of the cancellation because of the pandemic some time ago. Um, so as um, Alberto mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, geometric uh, properties of adiabatic uh, quantum thermal uh, machines. Um, and uh, here is just the, the, the time difference indicated <laughs> below. <laughs> here is Indian time and here is Buenos Aires time. It's quite early for me. Um, well, so this, um, oops, there is some problem with the, ah, yeah, now it's working. Um, this uh, work uh, has been done in collaboration. I'm basically going to talk about uh, two recent uh, papers, uh, which were done uh, in collaboration with uh, all these uh, people, uh, Pablo Abuso from uh, Barcelona, uh, Vivek Bandari, who was a PhD student in Pisa, but uh, he's right now a postdoc in Rochester. Uh, Pablo Terren Alonso from Buenos Aires, uh, a PhD student uh, in my group. Um, Rosario Fazio uh, in Trieste, Felix uh, von Oppen uh, in Berlin, uh, Martí uh, Peragno Lobet, uh, who is in Geneva right now and uh, Fabio Tadei uh, from uh, PISA. Uh, so the first uh, thing that come to our mind when we talk about thermal machines are these uh, cycles. Um, this is uh, just an, an example at uh, the Stirling uh, cycle, which typically work um, uh, by means of performing four strokes, two of them in contact uh, to reservoirs at uh, different uh, temperatures. Uh, but the regime I'm going to address now uh, is perhaps better illustrated by this other type uh, of machine, which is a mechanical machine, but we can make a sort of translation. Uh, it is this Archimedes um, uh, pump, Archimedes uh, screw, uh, which uh, allows to pump water against a, a gravity mm, uh, by uh, turning uh, around a, a screw, a, a symmetrically designed a screw, we can pump water against uh, the, the, uh, the gravity, or we can also use the flow of the water uh, to generate uh, energy. Mm -hmm. These are the two regimes I'm going to address in a while, but implemented not in this microscopic object, but in this type of uh, small uh, size and quantum uh, systems in which the working substance it contains only a few levels. And this is uh, an example from a Pecola group. This is a qubit coupled to a... Um, circuit. Um, and I'm, the idea I, I want uh, to um, tell you is that the, this uh, kind of concepts, uh, like uh, the one introduced uh, by uh, Barry, um, are very uh, useful to characterize the operation of this uh, type, spe special type of uh, uh, thermal uh, machines. So this, uh, this is um, a, a, a copy of uh, some lecture notes by uh, Barry, um, where we can see some a cycle performed in a parameter space. Uh, this cycle is performed by some a quantum a system and the, a, the, the state of the system after performing the cycle uh, gets some a geometric a phase uh, which can be calculated in this uh, way. So I'm going to show expressions which are very similar to these ones, but not with the um, with the single uh, a pure quantum state, but uh, in the context of this more complex object in which we have some quantum system also coupled to uh, reservoirs. 
Uh, and the, these uh, results were published um, uh, already in two years, no, not two years, more than one year ago uh, in this uh, paper. Uh, so these are the goals of this uh, first part uh, of the talk. Uh, the goals are uh, to analyze the thermal uh, machines where the working substance uh, is made up of a few level quantum system. Um, we, I will focus on cycles uh, operating under small departure from equilibrium, so I'm not going to address far from equilibrium situations. Um, and I will, the, the, the aim is to unveil the geometric properties in the operation of these uh, thermal uh, machines. And uh, I will introduce to this end the concept of the thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor. This is a sketch of the setup. Uh, we have uh, the few level quantum system. This is the working substance I mentioned before. And this uh, small uh, uh, few level quantum system is operated <clears throat> um, by changing in time um, a set of uh, parameters in the Hamiltonian. Uh, in principle, I, I can have n of such uh, time-dependent parameters, which I collect in a vector x. And uh, this few-level quantum system is connected to reservoirs at the different temperature in principle, the temperature can also change in time, uh, although in most of the talk, I will focus on the situation where the time, the, the temperature uh, bias uh, doesn't depend on time, but in principle, it can. And um, it is important to notice here that uh, there we, have, we can have in this system a, a heat flow between the two reservoirs. Uh, and because of the driving with the time-dependent parameters, um, <clears throat> there is also some amount of uh, heat which is dissipated. Uh, so with the driving parameters, we typically generate some power P, and this power P uh, leads to dissipation, uh, which flows in the form of uh, heat into the reservoirs. Um, in the... Uh, as I mentioned before, I will focus <clears throat> on the situation where the driving uh, departs uh, uh, slightly from equilibrium. This means that the driving is uh, slow, and this means that the velocity with which these parameters change in time is small. So this x dot uh, uh, indicated the velocities of the time-dependent parameters. And I will also consider a small temperature bias. And I find it convenient to build up uh, this bigger uh, velocity vector in which I collect the in, the in the first entry, the velocity of the time dependent parameters and as an extra entry, the uh, time, the temperature bias. Uh, this is, uh, Summary of the operational regime I will address. This uh, regime is named is um, in this context is named adiabatic. So unlike a, a adiab adiabatic in the context of the um, uh, thermodynamic cycles. Adiabatic in this uh, context of driven uh, quantum systems means that the uh, time dependence is small. So as I said uh, be before, the velocities with which the time dependent parameters change are very uh, small. Um, and uh, as I said before, I will also focus on small uh, temperature differences, but I want to do any assumption about the kind of coupling between the central uh, a quantum system and the reservoirs, maybe weak coupling, strong coupling, whatever. And the, the a quantum system may also have a, many body interactions playing a role. So the, the formalism and the conclusions I will um, uh, 
uh, get in, in a while don't depend on any assumption about the coupling and the uh, fact of uh, and the, the nature of the quantum uh, system regarding the many body interactions. Um, it is useful to identify uh, heat fluxes and to relate the heat fluxes uh, with the power developed by all the external forces. This is first basically the conservation of the energy, which tells us that uh, the power, this is the net power performed in, in a given cycle um, by all the external uh, forces acting in this uh, quantum system. Uh, this uh, is exactly equal to the uh, sum of all the heat flowing into the reservoirs, mm, into the left reservoir and also the right uh, reservoir. Um, and as I mentioned in the first, uh, in, in the previous uh, slide, um, in principle, we could identify some portion of these this, uh, heat fluxes, which is transferred between the two uh, reservoirs. So it can flow from the hot reservoir to the cold or uh, the other way around. Um, and uh, this basically defines the uh, operational modes of the uh, machine. We can have a machine which operates as a heat engine, in which case we have some heat flow from the hot reservoir to the cold one. And um, in addition, we can get some uh, useful a power generated in the process. But on top of that, we always have some amount of energy which is dissipated into the reservoirs. Instead, in the refrigerator um, operational mode, we uh, can inject uh, some um, power from outside and use this power to uh, extract heat from the cold reservoir and inject into the hot uh, one. And in addition to this, uh, we have uh, some uh, dissipation. So unlike the usual um, uh, uh, thermodynamical cycles, all these operations take place at a finite uh, time. And because of that, we always have some uh, dissipation playing a role here. Um, so the strategy will be to get some formal expression, try to get some formal expression for this uh, transported heat between the two uh, reservoirs. And um, I will get some uh, formal expression for this at the lowest order in these velocities uh, I defined uh, before. So the velocity of the driving uh, uh, sources and also the uh, delta T, the difference, the temperature bias, which I insist I is I am assuming is uh, small. And um, I will also get some a formal expression for the uh, total generated power. Uh, again, I will focus on at the lowest order uh, in these uh, velocities. Uh, while the lowest order for the uh, transported heat fluxes is uh, linear, uh, for the case of the generated power, uh, the lowest order is uh, quadratic. Um, and uh, I will find interesting geometric uh, properties in this uh, procedure, which are defined in the parameter space of the time dependent uh, parameters. Um, the procedure, uh, to start the procedure, we defined uh, the Hamiltonian, which is a time-dependent Hamiltonian in which I include everything. I include a, a time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian for the um, fuel-level quantum system, which depends on time through the uh, parameters X. I'll define a Hamiltonian for the uh, third Thermal bus, I'll define a Hamiltonian for the contacts between the, the all the, the quantum system and each of the thermal bus. And I find it, we find it uh, convenient to um, 
also represent the temperature bias uh, in terms of a Hamiltonian. So uh, this is a procedure which was introduced by Lattinger uh, some uh, time ago, and uh, which is valid, valid only for small uh, thermal biases. I'll say a few words uh, in a while. Um, let me now introduce some important um, uh, operators in this uh, description. One of them is the um, heat fluxes, the heat flux operator, which is the time derivative with respect to the um, uh, Hamiltonian in each uh, reservoir and uh, taking the average over one uh, period uh, and also of the expectation value of this uh, operator, I will get the heat uh, uh, flow flux into each reservoir. So alpha here stands for the uh, left and right uh, reservoir. And it is also convenient to define a force operator. The force operator is minus the derivative with respect to the uh, time dependent parameters of the Hamiltonian. Um, and with uh, all these entries, I will construct a, a bold uh, operator which contains the effect of the forces and as a last entry, the, ener the energy flux um, operator into the right reservoir, which in my setup is the cold one. Um, I promised some few words about the Latincher approach of representing the time, the temperature bias in terms of a Hamiltonian. This is actually a representation um, originally introduced uh, by uh, Lattinger, but more recently um, reviewed and uh, redefined in a nice way, which is a uh, gauge invariant by uh, Tatara in this uh, work. Uh, the um, Hamiltonian, which contains the description of the thermal uh, bias looks like this, is a time dependent uh, Hamiltonian in which I introduce an extra time dependent uh, parameter coupled to the uh, heat fluxes uh, operators. And uh, interestingly, the velocities of these extra time dependent parameters precisely contain the, infor the information of the uh, temperature uh, biases, which can in principle uh, depend on time, but can be also constant uh, in time. Um, and now, given this, I can uh, do a sort of a uh, Kubo, uh, like a linear response. Uh, I can implement a sort of a Kubo linear response uh, formalism, uh, in which I consider these velocities as the small parameters. So the usual Kubo uh, formalism consider the time dependent pertur the amplitudes of the time dependent perturbations um, as uh, small uh, parameters in order to implement a linear response. We can proceed in a more or less similar way, but uh, expanding with respect to the uh, velocities. In this way, in this uh, linear response uh, approach, if uh, I compute the expectation value of any uh, operator at, at a time t, I get a first contribution which corresponds to the uh, expectation value of the Hamiltonian frozen at the time t. This expectation value corresponds to um, a, an equilibrium a problem in which time uh, is frozen. Um, plus um, linear uh, response uh, corrections, um, which depend on these adiabatic uh, susceptibilities, hmm, which are defined uh, below. So these susceptibilities are susceptibilities involving the uh, operator, um, so fluctuations uh, of the time fluctuations of the operator with which 
uh, I'm uh, studying the dynamics and the operators, these force operators are introduced uh, before. And not only the force operators uh, associated to the uh, time-dependent driving, but also to the force operators corresponding to the temperature bi uh, bias in the uh, Latin uh, formalism, which are these uh, heat uh, fluxes uh, operators. So the nice uh, thing here is that we can treat at the same footing the thermal uh, bias with the uh, time uh, dependent um, sources. Um, okay, the, the general structure for the expectation value as a function of time in this linear uh, response uh, description for this, all the components of this uh, force um, operators is the following. So the frozen contribution plus some um, extra contribution. This is the, the linear response correction, um, which uh, is linear in the uh, velocities. Um, okay, it turns out that there are, I, I'm not going into the uh, details, there are some um, relations uh, for the case of the um, heat flux uh, contributions, um, according to which only the thermal, uh, the, the, the temperature difference between the two reservoirs enters uh, the description. So in principle, I introduced two time dependent parameters, one for each reservoir, but uh, the only thing that matters uh, at the end is the, uh, the, the one uh, single uh, time dependent parameter or one single velocity, which contains the information of the uh, net uh, temperature bias between the uh, two uh, reservoirs. So this is the uh, general structure. And given this general structure, I can get explicit expressions for the um, transport uh, component of the current, um, which as I mentioned uh, in the introduction is linear in these uh, velocities. And uh, also some a formal expression for the power. So the, the power uh, can be calculated by um, uh, multiplying by the velocity each of the expectation uh, values of the uh, forces. Um, all these quantities are net quantities and they are integrated over a uh, one uh, period. And the power, as I also anticipated, is bilinear in these uh, velocities. And this is the quantity which is uh, actually associated to the uh, net rate of entropy production in this uh, process. Um, now I will uh, look more carefully at this um, uh, adiabatic uh, susceptibilities which out of which uh, I can construct this uh, thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor. So the thermal geometric tensor is precisely a tensor made of all the adiabatic susceptibilities that appear in this, um, in, in this uh, formulation. And um, it is um, a n plus one. So I recall that we have n uh, time dependent parameters. The plus one is because of the thermal bias. So this is an n plus one times n plus one um, tensor which contains a symmetric and an anti-symmetric uh, part. Uh, we can work more in detail and obtain some Lehmann representation for both of these parts, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part. And we immediately realized that they represent completely uh, different um, objects. Uh, this is uh, the expression for the um, a symmetric a part, um, and I, I will come back to this idea. Uh, this uh, symmetric part is uh, can be um, 
given the interpretation of a, of a metric in this um, uh, space of the uh, time dependent uh, parameters. And from this part, we will be able to define concepts like the geometric friction and the thermodynamic lens. These were uh, concepts that already were um, introduced or used uh, in the literature uh, before. Uh, but very interesting, uh, it is very interesting the fact that the anti-symmetric part has the structure of the um, of a very uh, curvature. Um, if we look back to the first uh, slide, I can show you very quickly. So this is the. Um, calculation introduced by Barry, we see exactly the same structure, but not for a single uh, state, quantum state. But here, it appears weight with the, uh, with, it appears for all the uh, states uh, of the full uh, system coupled to the reservoirs. And this P is the thermal uh, weight introduced by the coupling uh, to, the, to the reservoirs. And uh, well, this um, uh, very uh, uh, curvature has been uh, used to classify uh, um, closed uh, systems in the ground state, but we now see that it naturally appears here a sort of a, a thermodynamic generalization of uh, this uh, concept. And let's see the role it plays. Before that, let me mention that uh, as these uh, adiabatic uh, susceptibilities are uh, quantities which are calculated with respect to an um, uh, equilibrium a Hamiltonian, because uh, all the calculations for the susceptibilities are done with the Hamiltonian with the time frozen at the given uh, t. Um, and because of that, all these uh, susceptibilities and hence the, the, the different components of the uh, thermal geometric uh, tensor obey uh, on Sager uh, relations uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. This is what, how they uh, read. And these S are signs which depends on the uh, parity of the different operators involved in the susceptibilities. Uh, under a time uh, reversal um, operation. It turns out that one of the operators entering is odd under time reversal because it's an energy flux. This is an odd um, operator. And in many cases, uh, the driving, um, the, the operators associated to the driving uh, sources are even. So it's very common that uh, this uh, component of the, um, of the thermal geometric tensor is uh, anti-symmetric. Um, well, let's see the importance of this uh, fact. Let's assume that this is the case, that this, uh, uh, these components of the, of the um, uh, thermal geometric uh, tensor are uh, anti-symmetric. And let's see uh, what happens. So let's uh, calculate the work done by all the time dependent uh, forces. So here I name them with AC, um, but it means time dependent uh, forces. If I calculate the work done by the time dependent forces, I find this expression. I find uh, some component which uh, I can identify with the contribution to the dissipation because it's a bilinear uh, function in the uh, velocities. And we can immediately see that the, only the uh, symmetric component of the tensor contribute to this part. Uh, while we have some other component which uh, comes uh, multiplied so I, here I'm going to assume delta T, the thermal, uh, the temperature difference to be constant in time. Um, so uh, I was saying uh, I, I, I can identify this 
extra component um, of the work done by the uh, time dependent forces where it appears multiplied by this quantity delta t uh, over t and it we find here this um, this line uh, integral which also appears in this first uh, term of the um, of the transported uh, heat of the net uh, transported heat so here sorry the net transported heat will be the integral uh, over um, the period of of the so it's basically the the, the period times the uh, heat flux. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all the heat transported uh, in, in a period. And we see this quantity which appears with different signs because of this uh, fact that the, we have the, the, this anti-symmetric part of the thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor. Uh, in this first term of the transported uh, heat and also in this uh, uh, this contribution of the uh, work done by the uh, external uh, forces. Uh, while in the, in the case of the uh, transported heat, it also appears, of course, this, um, this other term, which is basically this, this quantity here is basically the thermal conductance. Yeah, so, so it's the, the heat uh, that is induced by the thermal uh, bias. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have uh, this uh, contribution which appears uh, here. Uh, and this is very interesting because this term here uh, in, the, in the work expression is what we identify with the concept of heat uh, work uh, conversion. Hmm? So it's, uh, uh, it's the heat that appears uh, here, and this is actually the uh, component that makes uh, this system to operate as a thermal uh, machine. So I'm coming back to this um, in more detail. So we can identify the two regimes here. One is the uh, heat uh, engine. Please notice that this is a line integral. So this line integral can have any sign. So this component here can have any sign. Um, and if I have a sign a conversion where the, I define positive, the heat where that flows into the cold uh, reservoir, we see that this component is always uh, positive. And if this line integral is also positive, so it contributes to the heat that is transported from the hot to the cold uh, reservoir, in the expression of the work, it appears with a minus sign here. So it appears that it, it uh, with opposite sign of the work of this other component, which computes the uh, dissipation. So this component here is precisely the useful work that can be extracted from the, uh, uh, from the thermal uh, machine. In this case, the heat engine. In the case of the refrigerator, we will have the opposite situation. If we have this uh, line integral with a sign that is opposite to the one that computes the heat leak between the hot and cold uh, reservoir, it can compensate this heat leak and can extract at the end of the day heat from the cold reservoir, injecting it into the uh, hot one. In that case, so if this component is negative, it will appear here in this expression with a positive sign and I will get some extra uh, uh, term uh, to be done uh, by the external uh, forces uh, in order to get this operation as a, a, a refrigerator. So some part of the work will flow and disappear in the form of a dissipation, but this is the work that can be transformed in order to extract heat from the uh, cold uh, reservoir. So 
At this point, it's important to highlight uh, some uh, facts of the, uh, I found uh, here. Uh, this uh, component that I identified before as a heat work conversion is precisely the counterpart of the work uh, produced in the usual uh, thermodynamic uh, cycles in the limit of zero dis dissipation. In fact, in the limit of zero dissipation means that this term don't uh, contribute at all and the only term that remains is precisely this one. So this is the only uh, contribution that survives uh, in the quasi-static limit of the uh, usual uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, cycles. Um, the other uh, important thing to highlight is that this quantity can be uh, represented in terms of uh, this uh, um, vector um, computed with the anti-symmetric uh, components of the uh, thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor. And uh, this has all the structure of a generalized uh, very phase. Um, the other thing uh, to highlight is that um, this uh, concept is basically uh, the counterpart at the level of heat of the, um, of, of the mechanism of pumping, which has been widely studied in the context of a charge. In the context of a charge, it means that you can a charge, um, a, you, you can a pump charge between two the reservoirs at the same a chemical potential. In this case, this term terms tells us, so look, if I eliminate here the delta T, this term still contributes to, so delta T means reservoirs at the same uh, temperature. This um, term here uh, gives us a mechanism to transport heat between two reservoirs at the same temperature. Doing what? Doing only a very small change uh, in time in the uh, uh, fuel level quantum system connecting the two uh, reservoirs. And this is very similar to the concept of a charge, a pump, pumping of charge. Um, well, furthermore, we can also extend if we have some uh, um, system for which the thermal uh, geometric tensor contains some anti-symmetric uh, component for the um, part describing associated to the uh, driving forces, purely driving forces, we can also have a pumping of a power between the different uh, driving uh, sources. This has also been addressed uh, in the literature. And very interestingly, um, it can be related uh, to um, to uh, related, it is possible to implement uh, special protocols for which we get uh, this pumping quantized and this is uh, a topological um, effect. I'm not going to address it, but uh, it is also connected with this uh, anti-symmetric uh, component of the uh, thermal uh, geometric tensor. Um, so this is a summary of the first uh, uh, part, uh, this, um, uh, of th these uh, results actually. Um, the, we have uh, the, the, the heat work uh, conversion uh, component, which, which is the fundamental mechanism in the operation of thermal uh, machines, um, has a geometric uh, nature and can be described in terms of a quantity, which is similar to the very phase that is associated to the anti-symmetric component to the, of the uh, thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor. And I didn't uh, mention it, but it will appear in the examples I explained in a while. Uh, it is very uh, important to uh, break uh, some uh, symmetries in order to get this uh, pumping uh, mechanism and some finite uh, effect for this uh, very phase. 
And of course, it is uh, very important to have at least a two parameter driving. We can see it immediately because we need to compute a line integral, which is uh, non vanishing. And if we have a single parameter, this is uh, trivially zero. Um, so let's uh, go to the examples. We analyzed the uh, two examples with very uh, similar results. The first uh, example is uh, qubit, uh, a qubit coupled to a, a, a bus uh, model, caldera legged like a bus uh, model by harmonic uh, oscillators. Um, at uh, different uh, temperatures. Uh, this is the generic um, uh, model for the qubit. We introduced here two time-dependent parameters uh, in these uh, two, two components of this uh, vector B. Um, and we consider harmonic uh, type uh, of uh, time uh, dependence with a phase uh, lag. And the asymmetry here is introduced by contacting one of the reservoirs with a sigma x and the other reservoir with a, a sigma z. So these sigmas are, of course, a Pauli matrices. Uh, this different type of, um, of a coupling um, can uh, be understood uh, as, follow, as follows. Uh, imagine that uh, at some instant, T, we have this uh, vector um, B pointing mainly along the X direction. Mm -hmm. And if uh, so, if points along the X direction, it will mainly couple with the left reservoir, while it, the uh, right reservoir will uh, remain uh, decoupled. Uh, as uh, the system evolves um, in time at some other instant T2, we will decouple, completely decouple from the uh, left reservoir and couple to the right reservoir. So if we implement this protocol in uh, some uh, way that this B increases, also in time, the, the modulus of the vector increases in time, we can here uh, get some, uh, for instance, some um, uh, flux uh, of uh, heat flux from the left reservoir into the qubit, and in this other instance, some heat flux from the qubit into the right reservoir. In this way, we can pump heat from the left uh, to the uh, right. We, if we add uh, the temperature difference to the reservoirs, we can have the operations I discussed before, and we can get a thermal machine uh, out of this. Um, in reality, this could be implemented in, for instance, in these uh, superconducting uh, qubits. Uh, in fact, these uh, superconducting qubits are modeled by effectively by uh, two level systems. And the coupling to the uh, circuit can be engineered in a way that uh, it is uh, mainly uh, modeled by a sigma x or a sigma y, depending on the ratio between these inductances and these uh, capacitances. So, uh, it is not crazy to think in this uh, um, a different type of uh, coupling uh, between the uh, two reservoirs implemented in this uh, circuits. Um, the other uh, setup we consider is somehow uh, similar, uh, but uh, it is um, formulated for, um, uh, for an electron systems. Um, in this case, it's a, a quantum a dot, an electron quantum dot, also with uh, two levels, also with a magnetic uh, field. It is coupled to a uh, fermionic uh, reservoirs uh, with some uh, polarization and different polarizations, the left and the right reservoirs. And in this way, we could implement also by means of the different polarizations, the, this uh, type of asymmetric uh, coupling uh, between them. 
Um, and uh, well, the interesting thing is that the, these uh, two systems were analyzed in completely different regimes. In the case of the qubit, we solved the problem in the limit of a weak coupling between the qubit and the reservoirs, in this case, in the limit of a strong coupling. And the results were very uh, similar. So I'm just going to briefly tell you uh, the results for the uh, for the qubit. These are typical plots for this uh, driving protocol I mentioned uh, before. Uh, typical uh, plots for this vector A um, uh, from which we can compute this uh, transported uh, uh, heat induced by the uh, time-dependent uh, forces. And uh, given uh, this, um, the, the, this structure of this uh, vector field in the parameter space, it is just a matter of uh, computing line integrals along different uh, protocols to get uh, the, uh, the value for, the, for this uh, transported uh, heat. And uh, it is from there we can also uh, compute the dissipation uh, because of the of the driving. These are the two plots uh, here. Red is the dissipation. Here is the transported uh, heat. In the case of the quantum dot, there are some uh, details which depends on the regime and details on on the model. But uh, roughly speaking, we get a very similar uh, results. Um, but uh, so. So far, uh, I just uh, introduced some concepts which are useful to uh, characterize these um, thermal machines. But uh, what about the performance? Uh, is, are these concepts also useful to characterize uh, the performance? And this is uh, what we analyzed in this uh, recent uh, work, still under review. Um, and the, to, in order to analyze the performance, uh, I have to analyze basically two things. How good is the machine uh, to uh, produce this, uh, this quantity, this transported uh, component, which is the key for the heat work uh, conversion, and how to control the dissipation? Because as I mentioned, there is always a dissipation. But uh, it's uh, very interesting that the dissipation is also characterized, uh, can be also um, characterized uh, uh, geometrically. And as I mentioned before, so this uh, we see immediately from this uh, structure that only the symmetric component of the thermal geometric tensor contributes to the dissipation. And um, uh, this, uh, so, so this has all the properties to define the metric of the of a, a, a metric in the space uh, defined by these parameters uh, x. Um, and here, to to control and to describe the dissipation uh, and to find a good bound for it. Uh, it is very useful, this uh, concept of the uh, thermodynamic uh, lens, which is the shortest uh, path between two points. This also made the geodesic. Um, uh, the one precisely which characterized the, the dissipation, given this uh, metric in the space. And um, there is also some uh, nice uh, results uh, obtained by uh, cauchy schwarz uh, inequality in this uh, integral, according to which uh, it can be shown that there is a lower bound for this um, for this length for this uh, uh, for this and in turn this means a lower bound for the dissipation, and this lower bound corresponds to the uh, protocol. Uh, for which the uh, heat production is constant uh, at any time along as, as the, the path uh, is uh, circulated. 
Um, so let's uh, come back again to these expressions of the work and the heat, and also in introducing um, this uh, notion of the um, of the lens. Um, we can uh, identify this. Uh, this is the part I discussed uh, before. This is the this a is uh, precisely the quantity that appears in the expression of the work. This is the, the term that we named before the heat uh, work uh, com uh, conversion term, uh, which was characterized by uh, this um, linear integral. This is the uh, very um, connection. Uh, here, sorry, I changed a bit the, the notation. In, instead of X for the time-dependent parameters, I am using B. Um, and uh, using uh, Stokes' um, theorem, I can uh, re-express um, this, this line integral into this, uh, this area integral. Because of that, I'm naming this uh, term A for area. Uh, and this is the dissipation, uh, this is the bilinear uh, contribution, which I'm writing it in terms of the length uh, square using the definition I introduced uh, below. As for the heat, we have the transported heat uh, component. This was the one that I stressed in the previous part, the one described by the very uh, like uh, phase. Uh, it is in this language, I identifying it with an area. And in addition, uh, we have this contribution due to the heat leak. Uh, this is basically the um, thermal conductance. Uh, so these are the same expressions uh, as uh, before, but I'm expressing them now, emphasizing the fact that the, the quantities that appear here have a geometric meaning, in particular the area and the length. And um, to characterize uh, the performance of the machine, we basically have uh, two uh, quantities. Let's focus on the case of the heat engine. In the case of the heat engine, there are two quantities of interest. One is the uh, power that we can get uh, out of the engine. This is basically the work done in a cycle di divided by the, uh, by the period. Um, using the previous expressions, I can write the um, a power uh, in this uh, way. So these tau d are intermediate uh, definitions would depend on the area and the length uh, before. And we also have the efficiency. The efficiency is what we get divided by what we have to invest. We get work and we have to invest heat. And uh, for the efficiency, we can get also this expression. This uh, prefactor here is uh, Carnot efficiency, the ideal efficiency of the uh, quasi-static uh, quasi uh, thermodynamic uh, machines. Um, in our case, we also have these uh, corrections to the, to the fact that we have the fine, they operate at a finite uh, time. And the um, as I said before, they depend on the length, the area, and also the thermal uh, conductance. Uh, to optimize uh, the performance, we want to get, in principle, a, a good uh, power. It is very difficult to get a good power and a good efficiency at the same time. One usually wants to optimize the power, and afterwards we see for that optimal power, which is the efficiency we can get or the other way around. Um, for instance, in the case of the power, we can get some expression for the maximum power. The maximum power corresponds to maximizing this expression with respect to the duration of the cycle, um, this, uh, the period uh, tau, so we can get for which period tau we can get the maximum value of this uh, power. 
and given that value we can get which is the efficiency at the maximum power. We can also get the, the, the other, I'm just showing here uh, this uh, one. So we can also get the maximum efficiency and calculate the power at the maximum efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, for simplicity, I'm just going showing the, this uh, one. And uh, for simplicity, and because uh, it, this expression is uh, particularly nice, we see that um, we have here for the maximum power uh, in the machine, an expression in which what appears here is the ratio between this, this area and the length. Mm -hmm. So if we optimize um, the, so the optimization of the thermal machine, given a, a, a temperature difference means that we need to find a protocol in the parameter space that optimize the ratio between the lens, the area and the lens. Mm? And this area and lens, I recall that are, they are defined in a parameter with a non-trivial metric, which is defined by this uh, symmetric component of the thermal geometric uh, tensor. And the area is related to this uh, quantity, uh, which we identified with the very curvature. Well, this is a problem that uh, looks uh, <laughs> Easy, but is uh, we when we posted the the, the uh, manuscript into the archive, uh, several mathematicians contacted uh, us very excited because they said, "Wow, oh, wow, this is a um, a very important uh, problem and still open in geometry," and they offered a plenty of, um, of references and even some reviews and some books uh, investigating uh, this uh, problem. And they were very excited. It is also named the Chigar um, um, problem. They were very excited to see that this problem was also relevant uh, for the description of uh, things like quantum thermal uh, machines. Um, so we implemented uh, this optimization. So this is something not easy, uh, as you could uh, imagine. Um, this optimization is, is something not uh, easy. Uh, but, and we implemented uh, some numerics uh, in, again in this uh, problem of the driven uh, qubit with two uh, time-dependent uh, components of uh, this uh, qubit uh, Hamiltonian and asymmetrically coupled to the reservoirs, as I explained uh, before. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically consider the same uh, model, but focused on finding protocols that optimize the uh, ratio between the area and the length uh, defined uh, below. Um, well, we basically uh, played uh, numerically, as I said, with different uh, shapes of uh, protocols, this um, type of protocols that we named the um, pizza uh, shape, uh, pizza, pizza slide uh, uh, protocols optimize the area uh, in the limit of uh, this radio, uh, radio taking to infinity, we can recover exactly the, the result for, for a quasi-static uh, cycle. Uh, but uh, if we want to optimize the ratio between the area and the length, uh, we found that the optimal protocols were this, uh, these ones. Um, so what I'm drawing here is uh, this uh, quantity, which, um, which is basically the very uh, curvature. Uh, and we see that uh, in order to optimize the area, yeah, we have to find some protocol that covers as much uh, area 
of uh, this quantity with the given sign. Yeah? Look at the, this uh, different colors correspond to given uh, signs, um, to the, uh, different uh, signs. So it's quite easy here to visualize which are the shapes uh, of the uh, optimal protocols with which uh, we can play. Um, and uh, this is the results for this kind of uh, protocols uh, and for different centers of the protocols uh, of this uh, optimal uh, ratios between area and uh, lens. And um, we see here Liliana, the relevance. Liliana, sorry, you are uh, yeah, beyond out of the time. Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry, yeah. yes. But I'm finishing anyway. Yeah, sure. So here is basically a summary of uh, the relevance of this optimization the, in solid lines is without optimization, uh, the protocols and these are uh, the optimized protocols in dust and we see that we can gain a, a lot uh, with this uh, gain. So uh, this is, I just flashed the outline of the talk and uh, I, I think that I said the, the, the main, the, the main uh, things. Um, let me just uh, emphasize that uh, this uh, general framework of the adiabatic um, description in terms of the thermal uh, geometric uh, tensor is, um, uh, is indeed very general and can be implemented uh, also in combination with the uh, numerical uh, methods like energy, DMRG, Monte Carlo, in models in which we are interested in analyzing the effects of many body uh, interactions, for instance. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for <laughs> taking too long. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so le, le, uh, are there questions? Um, so maybe I, I can start uh, myself with a question. At, at the beginning of your talk, you introduced this formalism, uh, Lehman formalism, or uh, Lehman. Where, where you, yeah, where, where you added, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know how to call it, a, a field. You, uh, so that you introduce a field conjugated to the uh, to the. Ah, no, 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 Latin chair, Latin chair. Yeah, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this formula. Is, that, is this field, does it correspond to a sort of um, Lagrange multiplier or is it a noise term or? Um... No, not, it's not exactly. So the point is uh, this, no, sorry, uh, this. Yeah, yeah, here, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, the point is, uh, I have some, I started with some description in which I have uh, Hamiltonians for everybody, right? And I also mm -hmm. have to, uh, to describe the uh, temperature bias at the same footing. So if I want to describe the temperature bias at the same footing, I have to describe the temperature in terms of uh, Hamiltonian, the temperature bias. And this is something non-trivial because uh, temperature is not easy to represent in terms of mm. uh, Hamiltonian, the temperature bias. So Latin chair did introduce uh, this uh, theory precisely to, uh, to this end and is something that um, is valid only um, in, linear, uh, in linear response. And you can show that uh, it's a sort of, um, uh, he gave the name of a gravitational field. It's like uh, introducing some analogy with um, a, an electric field that you introduced in a Hamiltonian which generates some uh, response in the form of a current. Mm. And in the same way, if you put, uh, if you proceed, uh, ah, uh, if, um, if you proceed uh, by analogy uh, with the uh, temperature bias, you can uh, get uh, 
similar expressions. It's not obvious because of that, I would like to mention this uh, other more recent uh, work uh, because there are some issues uh, with the gauge invariance and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that uh, simple, but uh, in principle, you can show that at least for um, DC uh, transport, you get the correct expressions. Mm? Uh, it's a practical way to represent a, a temperature difference in terms of a Hamiltonian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Carlos raised his hand and then Felipe. So, Carlos, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, Humberto. Uh, thank you, Liliana, for the, the nice talk. I was wondering on, on the Onsager reciprocity relations. Um, uh, when you have these examples at the end in which you, you, are, uh, you have this periodic uh, evolution of the direction of the magnetic field. So how, how does it work? There is like, there, I guess you also have on reciprocity relations in an yes. instantaneous way. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so yes, the point is that uh, on saga relations play a role in this, um, uh, in, in these quantities, these are susceptibilities because they are computed with the a frozen Hamiltonian. So frozen Hamiltonian means that you uh, that time is fixed, so it's an equilibrium problem. And uh, because of that, you have them. And uh, the point is that they are not always useful because if you have some a magnetic um, magnetic field, uh, it relates one component with the other components with the um, adjoint, but with minus the magnetic field. But anyway, they are, uh, for the frozen Hamiltonian, they exist. They are not always useful, but uh, they, they are satisfied. Simply because of the fact you are computing these quantities with an equilibrium uh, Hamiltonian. The yes. susceptibilities. Hmm? So yeah. you are computing susceptibilities so, with equilibrium, but the whole description is out of equilibrium because they enter in the corrections at the lowest order out of equilibrium. Yes, yeah, so my question is if they are satisfied in, in uh, your examples in which you flip. Yes, the they are satisfied. Yes, they are satisfied. They are satisfied because we solved them uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you mm -hmm. do approximations, maybe you break them, but uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So there's a, a question uh, from Felipe on the other side of the La Cordillera. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Hola, Liliana. Hola, um, Felipe. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. It, it was it is related to Alberto's question. So with this uh, Latin term, term, um, do you, do you need to consider a, a state? So I see I I, I I saw only the states of the or eigen state of this Hamiltonian, but because the the usual way will be not having this uh, Latin Hamiltonian, and then put the temperatures. Give, uh, giving some states for the bath, right? E to the minus beta for one bath, E to the minus beta two for the other. Yeah. So you don't have to but do this, this now, right? Implementing, yeah, this, I mean, this is a road uh, and it means basically implementing some non-equilibrium uh, calculation. This is in, uh, here we introduce them in order to get this, um, uh, formal expressions, right? Uh, these uh, formal expressions uh, in a procedure um, uh, formulated at the level of linear response in a cubo like uh, procedure. Uh, of course, once you get, and I'm not, once you get 
that the structure is this one. Uh, you can calculate uh, this quantity with any, any other uh, formalism, right? So the, 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 here the, the main goal was to get this structure and to identify uh, the different uh, contributions. Uh, it was a formal procedure, if uh, you want. Of course, in the practical uh, in the practical way of doing the calculations, you go and calculate this uh, mean value with your favorite uh, method, with uh, master equations or whatever, and uh, you can given uh, this uh, calculation, you do linear some linear expansion in all these uh, parameters and. If you, this procedure is correct, you will get exactly uh, this structure. Hmm? I'm not sure. So uh, I don't know if it is a practical way of doing the calculations. For the case of the quantum dot, we used exactly this uh, road. But the main motivation at this level was precisely to, uh, to unveil and to get uh, which is this uh, structure, treating the time-dependent parameters with the temperature bias on the same footing. Mm -hmm. I don't see more questions. Um, so, yeah, so I think we conclude here. Um, thank you again, Liliana, for your- Thank you, thank you very talk. much.